There were just three gates between them and freedom, but their greatest hurdle lay ahead, taking the tally lodge, the control room for the main gate. I knew the route, uh, even though I was land down, I sort of, you could see out, and I knew exactly the route uh, down uh, and right down to the tally lodge. I knew the gates we had to go through. You could hear the guy down at the gate uh, shouting up to the driver, all right, Debbie, how's it going? And he had the gate, the hydraulic opened and we drove straight through. We went through the Sagan gate, which is the administration gate, and then we drove down to the tally lodge area. The tally lodge was where the prison officers clocked in and out. The plan was to take it over, restrain the guards, and open the gate. The truck would then take the 38 escapees to Scarver, 20 miles away, where they would be met by the South Armagh IRA and taken across the border. On one side, you had the, the security hut or tally lodge. There was a brick post up in the corner sitting above you. And what I wanted to do was to park the lorry so that we could block as much of what was happening on the tally lodge from the Brit. My job then was just to sit there and watch David McLaughlin. And I was trying to keep him calm, but in certain ways he was trying to keep me calm. So uh, I was engaged in a conversation. I says, how you doing? He says, I'm all right. And he says, uh, I says, uh, you married? He says, I am. And uh, I says, any kids? He says, I have a couple of kids. I says, uh, how much do you earn? He says, not fucking enough. <laughs> So I was thought, I was always quite, quite sharp in the circumstances. Hi, right, lads. Right, how things? You're under arrest. Jack's Republic and Army. It's me, you be shot. We went into the out corridor, into the offices, arrested the screws, put them on the ground. I want you on the ground now. Face down, hands out. Now! At that point, Bick came in and left one of his team at the back door to arrest any screws who would follow in their footsteps. And at that point, we had control of the tally lodge. When we got into the back door of the tally lodge, there was a boy standing behind the door with a pistol. And he said, to us, get in there. And I didn't know, I didn't know what to make of it. And the last thing I thought of was, the provost. Never thought you'd get down there. I seen a prisoner who I recognised and said to Keith, Keith, keep quiet, this is a provost. And then pff, my heart started and I thought it was going to bust out of my chest. A phone call came through to the tally lodge. And I went right quiet, silence. Shh. Total silence. Nobody say a word. You, you up here now. And we brought the senior officer, and we brought him over to the phone. And two of us, one on each side of him, both armed, pistols at us at his side, told him to answer the phone. And if he said a wrong word, he wouldn't be able to say another word because be, the wrong word would be the last word that he said. Hello? And the phone call was from the emergency control room to say, that an alarm had been triggered in the tally lodge. And we could hear this, you see. And uh, he must, no, 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 no. And we were sort of pushing him, like, you know. And he says, what, what alarm are you talking about? The emergency control room said, the alarm that is, has went off is an alarm that's on to the TV, which when we looked over at the TV, there was a number of um, prison officers, prison staff, lying under the TV, and obviously one of them had had the alarm, and they all began moving away from the TV as a result of our taking a focus on it. And your man said to him on the phone, Red, come on, stop calling about now, no more messing around. And your man said, I already right, He said, well, reset the alarm, and then this was this guy's opportunity to send the signal, and he asked the guy on the other end of the phone in the emergency control room, he asked him, how do you reset the alarm? Everybody knows. We know how to reset alarms when we're prisoners, you know? Everybody knows, and see the minute he said it, the two of us just pushed the pistols under the side of his head. And we were listening very, very intently, and the guy on the other end of the phone says, ah, push it back in, you stupid bee, and put the phone down. And this guy drained, just physically turned 
white, you know, the same color as his shirt, because he tried to send a signal that something was wrong and the other guy didn't pick it up. We had actually hit this place probably about 20 minutes later, 15, 20 minutes later than we should have, which coincided with the change of duty on and off at that period. That was causing us problems because screws were coming off duty, screws were coming on duty. It was very quickly that we had, in the region of two dozen prison staff, arrested in the Tally Lodge area under gunpoint and the numbers were mounting. Our lads were standing in what we would always describe now as like a sea of screws. They were just surrounded by screws and under their legs everywhere. I could see these boys and to me, although they were in control of the tally laws, they weren't in overall control of, a, of the whole situation. And this boy was saying me and I said to him that I think we could take them. I said, I think we could take these boys here. And I don't know why he overheard what I said or why he just seen me speaking to somebody, but I was told in no uncertain terms to keep my mouth shut. He says to me, um, are you, are you a hero? You're a fucking dead hero. And he pointed a gun at me. The prisoners had exploited the jail's weakest link, the prison officers. But the staff's anger and humiliation unleashed an unexpected strength. It's unexpected. I will never know what happened. It's just all pond of them broke loose. I don't know who threw the first blow. I don't know what happened. Just everything was pond of them and scuffling everywhere around me. Um, I ran out and shouted the back. I said, go, everybody, go. So I went down to open the gate. Got the gate the whole way back ran back in towards Bobby. See when I did that, they drove two cars in and blocked the exit of the lorry. So the lorry wasn't going anywhere. So Bobby then says to me, open it, let the lads out. I remember then, I looked to my right, and there was something out of the back of the food lorry, and I thought, they were never going to stop jumping. There's a fight in this little open area, and there was a, a Brit in a box sentry box on top of the hydraulic gate to the right of it, literally, literally 10 yards away. And he saw, I mean, he saw the fight. He saw half a dozen of us bat our lumps out of each other down at this gate, but everybody's in uniforms. He didn't see any guns. He didn't see any weapons. The escape descended into a fight between prisoners and staff. Five officers were stabbed. I seen Jimmy first, then, and Jimmy's words were to me, he says, Campbell, the bastards have stabbed me. And I said, where? And I think it was his left arm he left it, and it was just below his armpit. But I said to him, Jimmy, you're going to be OK because there's not much blood, and there wasn't really an awful lot of blood. It transpired in later years when uh, there was a court case about the whole escape. The disparate gave evidence, says he thought it was uh, a melee between prison staff who were fighting each other. Come on, King Gold! 35 of us at that point ran, ran for the fence and three of us turned to hold the screws back with our pistols whilst everybody climbed over the fence. So we are going after these boys over the field, and one of them turned around and pointed a gun at me, and I thought it was a replica, and I kept running on him, and that's where he shot me. Shot me in the leg, and... Well, I went down, that was me out of it then. It was every man for himself. McFarlane, Kelly and Story quickly assembled three separate teams. We got up into this house and hijacked two cars in a van and headed off in different directions. <laughs> 